So we're just about ready to begin this week's parsha. We'll, we'll do the parsha in a nutshell in a moment, just as an introduction. Um, this is one of my favorite parshas in some some ways. It is a very Hasidic parsha, as you will see, in the sense that in this parsha you see that there's a, sort of an expanding definition of what it means to serve God and what's the ultimate setting in which we serve God. And we, we may we may get to some surprising conclusions from reading the portion. But we'll begin with sharing the screen and reading the Parsha, the portion in a nutshell. And so we get the general idea of the discussion. So of what the Torah discusses in this week's Parsha. Let's see what we can do here, share screen. Okay, so we are in the portion of Re'e, which literally means see, and we're going to have some very important principles of the Torah in this week's parasha, beginning with the concept of free choice. And from there, we move to the description of uh, many other laws that Moshe repeats in the end of his life, and also a description of certain commandments that apply in Jerusalem. So we'll begin. C, which is the name of the parsha, Re'e. Re'e means C. C says Moses to the people of Israel, I place before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing that will come when they fulfill God's commandments and the curse if they abandon them. These should be proclaimed at Mount, at Mount Gerizim and Mount Abal when the people cross over into the Holy Land. So there was a ceremony that the Jewish people performed when they enter the land of Israel. It's elaborated upon a few portions later in the book of Deuteronomy, but also in the book of Joshua when they actually did it. They stood between two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Abel, that are in Shechem in Samaria. And at that point, they, they, they listed a list of blessings and a list of curses. And the symb symbolism was there are two mountains, there are two paths. We, we, we get to choose which path we want. It's not ordained by God. And it's not uh, wasn't decided on our behalf. The choice is in our is in our hands. A temple should be established in the place that God will choose to make dwell His name there, where the people should bring their sacrifices to Him. It is forbidden to make offerings to God in any other place. It is permitted to slaughter animals elsewhere, not as a sacrifice, but to eat their meat. The blood in which the temple is poured upon the altar, however, may not be eaten. In other words, um, there's one place where we serve God. Up with, until God chooses the place, until there's a sort of a permanent place for God to serve God, people were able to offer offerings wherever they wanted to. Everybody could make an offering on their own backyard and serve God in that way. But once the temple, once Jerusalem is, once the place that God will choose has been chosen and been um, and, be, and, and been established, here there's one place, then there's only one place where the people are supposed to serve. And everybody comes to one united place and only there you can bring your offerings. However, um, if you wanna eat, if you wanna make a barbecue and you don't wanna eat an offering, but you wanna eat your own steak, that's okay. That you could do anywhere, provided you don't eat the blood. Now it's another discussion, we may or may not get to it. What is that? indicate. It may indicate that in the desert, before they entered Israel, they were not allowed to eat meat. The only meat they were allowed to eat was sacrificial meat. In other words, meat as part of serving God. So they would bring an offering to the temple where the priest would get some of the animal and the altar would get some of the animal. And then the, the Israelite takes them extra home for dinner and can have a barbecue. But there was no, what, what they would call, they would call it the, the, the flesh, the, the meat of the sacrifice. But the notion that you could have meat that is mundane, that is not holy, um, this parsha seems to imply, there's a debate, but this parsha seems to imply that there was, no, there was no way of eating kosher meat that was not connected to the sacrifice. Here, once we get into Israel, God says, well, you want, there's only one place to serve God, but if you want, you could eat meat anywhere in Israel. So we can elaborate upon that hopefully later. Then we have some more laws. A false prophet or one who entices others to worship idols should be put to death. An idolatrous city must be destroyed. <clears throat> the identifying signs for kosher animals and fish 
and the list of non-kosher birds first given in Leviticus are repeated. A tenth of all produce is to be eaten in Jerusalem or else exchanged for money with which food is purchased and eaten there. In certain years, this tithe is given to the poor instead. Firstborn cattle and sheep to, are to be offered in the temple and their meat eaten by the Kohanim priests. In other words, we have a list of the tithings, or at least some of the tithings, and <clears throat> we will we'll elaborate upon that when we get there. We have the mitzvah of charity, uh, obligates a Jew to aid a needy fellow with a gift or loan on the sabbatical year occurring every seventh year, all loans are to be forgiven. So if you're in the banking business, you may want to know that next year is the sabbatical year, but don't worry. Uh, we can talk about that. Uh, this mitzvah doesn't really apply in the practical sense. We can talk about the history of that, how that happens, but that's a very, as a concept, it's very important. In any case, all indentured servants are to be set free after six years of service. Our parsha concludes with the laws of the three pilgrimage festivals, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot, when all should go and see and be seen before God in the Holy Temple. Um, the, law, the, the holidays, the festivals are repeated in a few places in the Torah, in different books, in the third book, in the fourth, in the third, in the, and actually in all books, in all books except for the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth book, each list all the holidays. But every time the holidays are listed, there's a different emphasis. And <clears throat> some place, you know, in, in, in uh, for example, the fifth book, the fourth book, the emphasis is on the offerings, which offerings to offer in the temple on the holidays. In this parsha, the fifth book, in this parsha where we're talking about the place that God will choose, which is a phrase that repeats itself many times in this parsha, I believe over 10 times. So it talks about the place um, in the context of the, there'll be one place that you'll come to serve God. So in this parsha, the emphasis of the holidays is the aspect that it's a pilgrimage holiday that we're supposed to come to God and, and spend time there and rejoice. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the story in short. Of course, there's a lot to, to, to discuss and hopefully we'll begin right now. If anybody has any specific theme that they want to uh, talk about you are please raise it please met, don't don't be afraid to jump in um, uh, otherwise we'll we'll begin on our journey and we'll begin begin to make a little bit of progress here and uh, hopefully drill in and uncover some insight rabbi are you planning to discuss the blood of animals as sacrifice we are beginning in this in the in this blue book. The page is on 999. 999. Rabbi. He's not here. Okay, so we always whenever we don't know when to be where to begin with, we begin from the beginning. So I'm going to mention a few points on the first verse, Re C the concept of free choice. And of course, many people discuss this at great length, but I'm going to try to uh, just address it for a few minutes and then, and then continue and then move on to the other aspects of the Parsha. So the concept of free choice is critical to the understanding of the, to, to the entire Torah. Maimonides talks about the concept of free choice. And it's very interesting because as you know, Maimonides has multiple works, but the two most famous is the, are the Mishnah Torah, which is the code of law. And then there's the Moran of Uchim, the guide to the perplexed, which is a book of philosophy. And usually Maimonides is very clear that any philosophical discussion he reserved for the book of the guide for the perplexed. And in Mishnah Torah, the, the code of law, that is where he puts specifically the legal, the legal discussions. However, once in a while, in the code of law, Maimonides gets into philosophy. And this is an example. There are two full chapters in his code of law about the concept of free choice, which is unprecedented because like I said, he really does not get into philosophy. Maybe the first four chapters of the book are philosophical, but even that is for a halachic purpose. But here you have the middle of the discussion of teshuva and repentance. You have two full chapters discussing free choice. And what Maimonides basically says is if there's no free choice, there's no morality. If there's no morality, there's no Torah. We're wasting our time. Let's close the books. Let's go play golf. Um, if we're here today, if we're studying the Torah, it's because we believe in the concept of morality, that there's right and wrong. 
but there's no right and wrong if there's no free choice. So for example, if you believe that a person is primed to do uh, a certain act by their environment, by their circumstance, by their circumstances, and it is not in their power to change it, if that is the case, then if that is the case, then how could you per hold the person accountable? How could you say it's a crime to kill somebody? How could you put someone in prison and say, punish you, we as a society is punish, are punishing you for doing something wrong if it's not in your power to not to do it? If it's not in your power to refrain from doing so, then justice is not justice, justice is cruelty. And therefore, Maimonides says that a foundational principle of the Torah, if God says do not murder, if God says do not steal, if God says don't commit adultery, if God says any commandment, the premise of every commandment is the, is the idea that you have the freedom to choose. Now, in the ancient world, the concept of free choice was radical. Nobody believed, everyone believed that we're all controlled by the gods and a person doesn't really have much choice. And therefore, the more, more, people were not very moral because they had to. They would they would follow any any instinct and say you say why, why why are you doing it because that's my nature I have no choice I have no control over myself. The issue here is that in the modern world, the idea the notion that there is no free choice is making a comeback, and there are a lot of philosophers and psychologists who really argue and say that for the most part we do not have free choice, and they say well if you really could think about it, if I knew everything about you then I could predict exactly what you're gonna do in a given situation. And that is dangerous because that's the, that, that's the antithesis of the Torah. So for the Torah, to, to accept the Torah, we have to believe, and that's Moshe's point here. Moshe's point here is it's in your hands. Now it's in your hands doesn't mean you're not challenged. It doesn't mean that the right choice and the wrong choice are just as easy for you. It could be that for you to make the right choice is gonna take tremendous amount of effort. And for somebody else who has a different nature or grew up in a different environment, that same choice is going to come much easier. So when we say you have free choice, it doesn't mean that it's 50-50. The pull to negativity and the pull to positivity is just is, is the same. We're not, we're not saying that. But what we are saying, the big distinction is, am I controlled by my instincts or, or could I overcome my instincts? And that's essentially the question. And Moshe here, Moshe here is saying what God says that for most people, the choice is in your hands. Of course, there are always exceptions. And therefore, in Torah law, even if you go back to uh, 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 thousands of years ago, when the, their understanding of human psychology was uh, not as advanced as today, in Torah law, there was the notion that if somebody is not mentally healthy, they are not guilty. And it's very interesting. It's very, there, there, there are ramifications to this law. So if, if God forbid somebody's not mentally healthy and they go and they burn down my house, now they could be billionaires. They could have, have inherited a billion dollars. If they do something and damaging, they, they don't have to pay. They're absolved from payments. Even though you say, why not? Why don't we build that? We, we build a bank account. No, it doesn't work that way. Why? Because if somebody is mentally incapacitated, then, there's no free, then they have no free choice. And if they have no free choice, they have no guilt. And if they have no guilt, they don't have to pay. So, of course, there are exceptions to the rule, not just exceptions that we understand today in the 21st century, but thousands of years ago, we already understood that there are exceptions. But for the most part, for the average person, there is free choice, and that's the point Moshe is making today. See, I place before you today the blessing and the curse, um, and that's the opening phrase of the Parsha. Okay. So, how, so how does um, Rambam say that it's not true? The blessing and the curse, and the blessing comes when you follow God's commandments, and the curse is if you don't follow God's commandments. That is chapter. That that is the, the following verses, verse twenty-two and twenty, and verse twenty-seven and twenty-eight, in the beginning of the parsha. Okay, I just want to address this concept for a second, getting a little bit more philosophical, and going into philosophy and theology, and maybe a Hasidic philosophy. And this concept is a little bit uh, hard to understand, but it's important to understand. Um, what Judaism says, at least from the perspective of the Hasidim, Hasidism, and the Kabbalah, and even though we may not feel this all the time, but at least it's under, uh, important to understand what, what, um, what, does, what, what, what Jewish philosophy thinks about the concept of blessing and curse. No, I can hear you. 
Um, Elisa wants to know, how does Rambam say it's, it's not true? Um, the Rambam is talking about the average person. The Rambam, of course, is not talking about the, the exception. There, are, there is an exception. There are people who are mentally incapacitated. Who decides who is mentally incapacitated, who is mentally able to be considered responsible for their actions? Well, I'll tell you who it's not, who's not who, who, who doesn't decide, I don't decide. Who would decide? The medical profession, the medical field, the medical knowledge of the time determines because the Torah says in many cases, you have to go to the doctor and the doctor is the one who determines and that's called, it's true for physical health and it's true for um, mental health as well. That they're not being too trusted. Um, try to, can you, I think, I, I don't know if I could hear you, but try to ask the question because I'm not sure I understand. Uh, I oh. think, you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I think you said, maybe I misunderstood that, that when Rambam wrote about it, he said that it's, um, that there's not free choice. Did I misunderstand? Uh, yes. Yes. Matt, you misunderstood. Okay. Rambam says if there's no free choice, there's no Torah. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Uh, says the, number, the fundamental principle of the Torah is that there must be free choice. And he spends a lot of time defending this post because in his days, as in, like I said, in the ancient world, but even in his days, many people believe there's no free choice. And many people brought proof from the stories of the Torah to show that there is no free, free choice. And Maimonides deals head on with those challenges. For example, there's a verse that appears many times in the book of Exodus. That it says that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And if God hardens Pharaoh's heart, it means it implies that Pharaoh has no choice but to um, disobey God and therefore be punished. So this is really an, a, a critique, a question on the concept that there's always free choice. So Maimonides has to deal with it. All I'm trying to say is that it was a very common notion that we don't have free choice. And like I said, today, this notion is coming back. But just because it's coming back, it doesn't mean it's true. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Vicky. Um, yeah, I, I just want to clarify, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, I just want to clarify if uh, maybe somebody addresses that already. So the, the way the notion comes back, I think, but through the subconscious programs that are in our psyche from childhood, and that becomes an excuse. So again, it comes back to the decision who decides who is capable of making the choice and who is not. I'm just wondering if Cassidus addresses that. So again, the, 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 the notion that certain people are primed to make certain decisions, that is, we understand and we accept that. That's obvious. The question becomes, if I'm primed to do something, doesn't mean I'm forced to do it. That's the, that's the defining question. And if the medical profession uh, at the time says, I am mentally incapacitated, and when I pull the trigger, I have no choice but to pull the trigger, then indeed I should, I should be absolved. But the point here is the, the idea that we're not, we're not arguing that for some people it's not more difficult. For some people, certain choices are much more difficult because they're primed for whatever reason, because of their nature or because of their upbringing, they're primed to make certain choices. But the question is not if they're primed to do so, if it's, if, if it's natural, what, what their instinct is. The question is, is it possible to overcome your instinct or am I just a sophisticated animal that is not able to, to overcome my instinct? Now I say, thank this, you. I'll say yeah, thank I, I said this in the past, but I'm gonna take 60 seconds because it's a nice story. Um, if you go back to the story of the first story of free choice in the Torah, the tree of knowledge, and that is where the, the, the serpent um, convinces Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge. And over there, of course, every detail of the story is precise, but there's one beautiful interpretation from the Malbim, and he says something fascinating. He says, if you look at the conversation between God and Adam and Eve, and between the snake and Eve, you will understand the big philosophical dispute, and you'll also understand why Eve ended up listening to the serpent. So I'm going to do this very briefly. When God introduces the commandment, the, the, the idea of not eating of the tree of knowledge, the verse says, Vayetzav, God commanded Adam. And he said, don't eat of the tree of knowledge. Commandment. Commandment, if you say commandment, commandment implies that you have free choice. You can't command somebody to do something that they can't do. You can't command the water to start to uh, defy gravity. It doesn't work. Commandment means you have a choice and I command you. If you can't command me to fly to Mars, it's impossible. I don't have the choice. So God uses the term command by Yitzavi commanded, and 
Obviously, that's free choice. Now, what does the serpent tell Eve? He says, is it true that God said you should not eat of the tree of knowledge? So the serpent uses the word amar, said. That is very significant. So the Malbim explains that what the serpent is telling um, Eve is as follows. There's said is not commandment. Said is a communication from God. So what the serpent tells the human being is, look, you're a sophisticated animal. How does God convey his will to the animals? How does God speak to animals? How does God, we know what God wants from us from the Torah, but how does the lion know what God wants of it? The answer is God speaks to the lion. How does God speak to the lion? Through its instincts. If God created the lion with the instinct to prey upon the zebra, then that's exactly what God wants the, 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 the lion to do. You open, open YouTube and, and watch the videos of the jungle of, of, of Africa and how the lion is attacking the zebra and you look in all the comments and all the comments say, what a terrible lion and how could the lion be so cruel? The lion's a fine guy, did nothing wrong. He's doing exactly what God wants of it. Why? Because God spoke to the lion and God said, I want you to attack the zebra. When did God speak to the lion? Did, he, did, he, did the lion get the Torah? No. The, the instincts that God created the lion to attack, that is the instinct of survival. That's God's will of the lion. So what does the serpent tell Eve? Really, what does Eve see in the serpent and reflect back at herself? Basically, they're saying is God is speaking to me too through my instincts. If I want the fruit of this tree, that's because God is telling me you have to do it and there's no way you can't do it. In other words, the big mistake is that we move away from the concept of commandment and we believe that instinct is the divine communication the way it is regarding animals. With the human being, instinct is not the way God, 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 God um, speaks to us. God speaks to us with the voice of morality, the voice of the Torah, because we have the, we, we alone in the creation have the power to overcome instinct. So this is a big discussion. Again, the discussion is not whether or not I'm prone and I'm inclined to do something bad. The question is, am I forced by my instinct or am I able to overcome my instinct? So that, a, lot of a lot of responsibility in the, in the physician, huh? The doctor. Yes, yes. Even if the doctor has a lot of responsibility, life and death matters is in, is in the hands of the doctor. Right now, should I take my first vaccine, my second one, my third one? Should I, should I, should, should I do this? Everything, life and death. I mean, every day, the physicians are making life and death choices and they're empowered to do so by the Torah. The Torah says a person has to go by the medical knowledge of the time and you have to do what, what, what the majority of the, of, of, of the medical community believes at the time. It was just Maimonides, uh, we studied in Maimonides two days ago. So the discussion of Yom Kippur and somebody is not feeling well. And they don't want to eat. If they want to eat, they're allowed to eat. But they say, I don't need to eat. I'm, I could still, I could still, I can still, I can still fast. And there are a few physicians. And one physician says the person has to eat. And the other phys physician says the person doesn't have to eat. So who do you follow? Again, if the patient says I need to eat, even if all the physicians in the world say you don't, we trust the patient. Because a person knows himself better than any doctor could know them. But if the patient says, I don't know, I don't need to eat, and the physician says you do have to eat, then you do have to eat. But what happens if there's a debate amongst physicians? So then you have to follow the majority of physicians. But you're right, there's matters of life and death is in the hands of the physicians. In other words, the physicians represent the collective medical knowledge of, 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 the, of society at the time. Go ahead, Jill. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, is there any awareness that you can see in the Bible of a recognition today that we have such unconscious motivation so much of the time even the most clear thinking of us operate from motives and and um instincts or impulses that we really don't understand that's a very good question that's a very good question because i see and it within the stories of of the bible that we see that there's a recognition that people have un you know subconscious motives um, I, I, I would hesitate to, to, to point at something right now at, on, on the spot, but I think that the characters of the Bible are so complicated and they're just following the stories you see, for example, just a simple example. Um, you're reading the story, again, you have to read the story with an open mind. You remember the Torah can't say so openly that, oh, there's the conscious and the subconscious and you're motivated by your subconscious. The people receiving the Torah at the time didn't understand what you're talking about. But 
if you think about the stories of the Bible, you will see how there is um, intergenerational trauma. In other words, inter intergenerational motivation. So for example, go to the story, the, 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 the uh, defining story of the, I think of the book of, of, of Exodus, the, uh, the book of Genesis that ties us into the book of Exodus. The fact that all the Jewish people end up in Egypt, which is the foundation of our people. We become a people in Egypt. Why? Because the brothers sold Joseph. Why did the brothers sell Joseph? Well, the father was jealous. Okay, that's a fine interpretation because the father loved him. So they were jealous. Okay, that's a fine interpretation. But the Torah gives you enough clues to say, look back a second. That was not, that's not it. I mean, I'll tell you the truth. My mother brought my brother a fancier uh, shirt that she bought for me. I wasn't tempted to sell him as a slave. I'll make a confession. Okay, even though he got a later version of, of, of the Game Boy. He used to have Game Boys. Now it's iPhones, now it's iPods, whatever. I wasn't, I wasn't, I was not uh, tempted to sell my brother. So what, so what happened over there? The father brought the brother a fancy tunic and therefore they sold him as a slave. No, of course not. It goes much deeper than that. What's the deeper? Go a generation earlier. Generation is there are four wives and this conflict between the mothers. And if the mothers are in conflict with each other, they pass that on to their children. It's not the shirt. It's not the shirt. It's what the shirt represents. So all I'm trying to say is if you look at every, any story in the Bible, you see there's so much complexity and there's so much, there's so many layers within a human motivation that, that I think that if, at least from our looking from hindsight, you say it's right there. It's almost like hiding in, it's hiding in the open. That's how I would, that's, that's what I would think. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. That answers my question also, and also tells us that it's not an excuse, even if you are motivated by some subconscious program that you Correct. cannot even understand. Correct. Correct. Again, my motivations are, are less important. What's more important is um, now that we have the voice of morality, now we know right from wrong, which is what the Torah is doing. Now that we know right from wrong, I have to know that regardless of my motivations, if the Torah says something is 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 is, is bad, you can't, you can't sell your brother as a slave, even if you really want to, and even if it's not your fault, it's because your mother, it's because the tension that you sense within your mother is, and, and the conflict with her sister is now being passed on to you and your, and your brothers. Um, that, that you can go to your shrink and you can discuss it and you can work that out, that's wonderful. But in reality, you know that you're not allowed to sell your brother as a slave because you can't, you can't kidnap. So that is, um, that is something that the question is, could I control it or not? That's the essential question. Why it happens, we're not sure. Maybe we are sure, but we don't know. Go to your shrink. If you pay enough, eventually you'll figure it out. But that's almost, that's secondary. That's secondary to the essential question is, am I able to overcome my instincts when I want to sell my brother as a slave? That, from Moshe's perspective in this week's Parsha, is the most important question. Okay, I want to get into a little philosophy here for a minute or two, theology really, about blessing and curse, and then we want to get to the, to the reason why I love this Parsha so much, which is the joy, which is the being in Jerusalem, which is the tithings, There's a lot of excitement here. So I'm just going to show you the verse, um, share the screen again, here we go, this is the opening phrase of the Parsha, Re'e, behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. And what is the blessing? The blessing that you will heed the, com the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And the curse, if you will not heed the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn away from the way I, com from, from the way I command you this day to follow other gods, which you, you did not know. Okay, fine. Um, let's start with the first verse. Re'e, see, behold, I set before you today, anochi notain, I, but it's an I, as we know in Hebrew, there's, there's, there's uh, two I's. There's ani, which is I, and there's anochi, which is the first word of the Ten Commandments. Anochi is much more formal, and it means the essence of self. So I, meaning Moshe speaking on behalf of God, I, God, I set before you today, but it's, it's really notain, I give. And as we will point out, the word notain comes from the word matana, a gift. So in some sense, you could read this verse, behold, I gift you today the blessing and the curse. Now, what does it mean simply? Simply it means free choice, and free choice is a gift because that gives us significance to our actions. If we have no free choice, we have no significance. In other words, there's no significance. Our actions are, don't have any meaning because why do we do it? We do it because we were primed to do it. We do it because uh, that's our instincts and we have no choice. But the moment we have free choice, that is a gift, the gift of free choice. And that's why we use the term notain, which is the, the word of matana, of gift. Okay, but nothing could be this simple. It has to be a little bit more complicated. And um, Kabbalists, 
and other philosophers want to understand this verse. See, I place before you today a blessing and a curse. How, what does this form? How does this exactly work? That the curse comes from God. In other words, if the premise is that God is the ultimate good, and the premise is that everything comes from God, it seems that everything comes from God, at least God is saying, here, I place before you today the blessing and the curse. So what does it mean that the curse comes from God? Why would God do something bad to, to us, give us something bad? Okay, you could say that, well, it's a result of our choice. God is not giving us the, the evil. The evil is a result of our choice. We are doing something bad, and therefore the curse is coming upon us. That's the conventional answer. The problem is that if you look at the verse carefully, it's not exactly what the verse says. The verse says, today, see, in English, it's not such a difficulty because they, they mistranslate it to, I set before you today. I'm putting before you. Here, I'm gifting before you today. I'm giving you the blessing and the curse, which at least in the simple reading implies both the blessing and the curse comes from God. And the question is, uh, how could the curse come from God? How would God give us something neg as negative as a curse? So there's a beautiful Hasidic uh, interpretation from the Rebbe about this. But at first, to explain this, it analyzes the translations of this word. So if you look at the most, uh, your average Chumash, your average Bible, most, published, most publications of the Bible, at least most Hebrew publications of the Bible, almost virtually all of them is going to, are going to have a commentary called the Commentary of Unculus, translation of Unculus. I have my book right here in the art scroll. Um, you see that the wide text in Hebrew is the Tchumash, and the small little column with smaller text is the translation of Unculus. Who was Unculus? Unculus was a Roman convert, and he translated the Torah into Aramaic, which was the pre predominantly spoken language at the time. He's a fascinating character without getting into who he was. He was from a a uh, very prominent Roman family. He was the nephew of um, Titus, the general who destroyed, the king really, who destroyed the second temple. So he's from a very prominent Roman family. Long story short, he converts, comes to Israel, and he becomes a great scholar, sets out to write one of the earliest translations of the Torah, which of course, translation is the commentary. And that's, um, that becomes a very part of Jewish tradition. In fact, the code of law says that every Friday you have an obligation doesn't say it on Friday before Shabbat, you have an obligation to prepare for the weekly Torah reading by reading the Torah in the Hebrew and in the Aramaic. It's called twice the scripture, once the Aramaic. Shnai mikra ve'echad targum. Basically, they wanted everybody to read the Torah, but they also wanted everybody to understand the Torah. So they say you have to read the Hebrew and then you read the Aramaic. The problem is that if you say you have to read the Hebrew and the Aramaic, you're seeming to say that the Hebrew and the Aramaic are on the same level. So to highlight that the Hebrew is more authentic, you have to read the Hebrew twice and the Aramaic once. And that's what people do. You read it and you start with, you start with the first verse, you read it twice in Hebrew and once in Aramaic. And that's how you go through the entire Parsha. It's in the code of law. Now, so he's the more common Aramaic translator. However, there's another translation in the Torah into Aramaic called Tal Targum Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem translation, and other people call it um, Yonatan ben Uziel, the translation of Yonatan. In any case, it's an earlier translation of the Talmud, of, of the Torah into Aramaic. Now, how do they deal with this verse? So, Unculus translates, see, I said before you today, the blessing and the curse. He says, Birchan ulevatin, levatin is Aramaic for curse. That's it, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. But if you look at the other translation, he has a very interesting translation. He says, see a place before you today, the blessing, and instead of saying levatin, which is Aramaic for curse, he says, and it's exchange. V'chilufa, it's exchange, which is very, a very strange term because what does exchange have to do with curse? Not only this exchange doesn't seem connected to curse, but actually it's, it's actually, um, it's actually uh, contradictory almost. Because when you say exchange, exchange is like a substitution. When you say one thing could stand in for the other, one thing could substitute for the other, one thing could be in exchange for the other, it means they have to have some relation, right? We have some relation, therefore I could fill in for you. But if I'm your opposite in every way, then I'm not an exchange from you, for you, I'm something completely different. So here, what the translation of Unculus is telling us, he's telling us, see, I place before you today the blessing and the exchange, meaning the curse is not the opposite of blessing, it's the exchange of blessing. 
what is the what what does he mean? What does that what does that translation mean? And without getting into too much detail, this leads to the Kabbalistic notion, and it's hard for us to accept, but we have to, we we're, we're supposed to believe this, and that is that really nothing evil comes from God, and when something bad happens to us, that seems to be a curse, that seems to be evil. It is not the, 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 it's not, it's not that God is trying to do bad for us. The bad is a substitute for the good, meaning it's a exchange for the good, which means it's another form of good. There are two types of good. There's the revealed good and the concealed good. And the curse is really the exchange of the revealed good. Exchange means the outer form exchanges. Instead of the good being something that is just that, that appears to be good and is also good, but it also but it only appears to be good, but it also appears to be good. Sometimes we get the curse and the curse is negative, but the inner meaning of the curse is good. In other words, deep down within the negativity is really good, but the good is concealed. And that's why it could be understood to mean to be the exchange of the blessing. What do I mean? So you have all the examples which we always bring. And that is that sometimes when a good is too deep, we can't perceive it as good. So if an example, an example is that a child doesn't understand why a mother is, is, is taking the child to the dentist. They don't like the dentist because the dentist has the drill. They still have drills, I think. The drill, why, why can anyone invent a drill? It doesn't make noise, I don't understand. But the dentist still has a drill and it's painful. And the child does not perceive how something negative, how, how, how that, negative actual, that negative experience actually has an inner good and benefit. And um, generally speaking, what the Kabbalah is going to say is anything that we perceive as evil is only evil from the outer external level, but deep down there's a, it leads to a deeper good. And we don't always see it, and that's why sometimes we have to believe it. But that is the deeper meaning found in this translation, that the curse is really defined as the exchange for the blessing, which means it has the same inner blessing. It has the same, it's, it's, it's also, the curse is also a blessing in that both express the divine love because both in the blessing and the curse, God is present with us. The only question is if we perceive it that way or the good is so concealed because it's so deep. And that's another point. Sometimes the deeper the good is, the harder it is to perceive. So a child cannot understand something that is above its, above its capacity to understand. So it appears to be evil. For example, I'm a child. I want birthday cake for my birthday. What happens if you tell me, well, the cake is not healthy for you. So instead of giving you a birthday cake, I'm going to take the money and I'm going to put it into a savings account. And in a few years, you'll have a few more points of interest. Those are the days when they were still interest in bank accounts. Now they don't do interest anymore. But uh, maybe you can get, I don't know, a quarter, of a, percent, a quarter of a percent if you're lucky. But the point is, in the good old days, you got interest when you, went, when you put money in the bank. So today you have to go to the stock market. But in any case, so for the child, you're taking away my birthday cake and you're giving me a piece of paper, that's cruelty. Why? Because the child cannot understand and cannot perceive how the good of the piece of paper doesn't understand it. So therefore for the child, it looks, it, it appears to be negative. But in reality, when the child, when the parent is giving this to the child, it's a deeper form of good. Same thing is with discipline. When a parent disciplines a child, from the perspective of the child, it's an expression of abandonment. It's an expression of cruelty. But the reality is from the perspective of the parent, the the discipline is actually a deeper love. It's for the benefit of the child, and it's actually much more difficult for the parent to do, which means it comes from a deeper place within the parents. But this is a big topic, so I'll take a question from Jill, and then we'll see, and then we'll see if we can continue. Go ahead, Jill. Okay. Rabbi, the, the elephant, the big elephant in the room is always the Holocaust. What would Ankalos have said the same thing post-Holocaust? Uh, and I know we. this is everybody's question, and it's always. Right. The question stands, and the question should stand. The answer has to be a person of faith has to believe. Again, again, there are different solutions. The short answer is, if you believe in, if you believe in, 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 in traditional Judaism, certainly if you believe in traditional Judaism from the perspective of the Kabbalah, if you believe that God is in control of everything, in other words, there's nothing else in reality outside of the domain of God, then you have no choice but to say, the same thing applies to any pain in the world, including, including, including the most severe pain and including the most difficult scenarios. What you could say and what you should say is, I don't understand how this is good. 
And therefore, we, 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 we ask, we, we tell God this is unjust because from our perspective, it's unjust because from our perspective, it appears to be a curse. And therefore it's unjust and therefore it's wrong. That is from our perspective. But nevertheless, we have the capacity to have faith in God and understand that even in the most difficult circumstance, it's not an abandonment of the people and God is still with us. And some people who survived the Holocaust were able to maintain that feeling, some were not. I'm not judging anybody, but from a theological philosophical perspective, there's no question that, that no matter how terrible the curse, the, 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 the theological answer stays the same. And that is that we don't understand how this is good. And from our perspective, it's evil and cruel, but, but we, but we believe that God is present in every reality and everything is, we're never in a place where God is not. And therefore we understand this to mean that, that this is a concealed good, which appears to be as a curse, but in a very deep level that we may never understand while living on this earth, we, it, there is a hidden love, a hidden good and a hidden love and we, we may never understand it on this earth. So it's clearly an act of faith is the short answer. But faith means that you cannot understand it. If you could understand it, you don't need faith. If everything, if I have blessing in my life, I don't need faith. I see, I feel the presence of God. The faith is when, like King, where King, King David says, even when I walk in the shadow of the valley of death, I know you're with me, that's faith. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay, I want to take a few more minutes. Too much philosophy, and I want to talk about. I want to talk about the Torah's obligation. You ready to take family vacations, and to be very happy. This is the first time in the Torah, where the Torah says clearly an obligation to rejoice. And what exactly happened, what exactly happened within this Parsha that triggers Moses to start talking about joy? So to explain that, I want, I want to start thinking about, so to, I want to start thinking about the second tithing. So again, again, we're, 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 we're thinking about, we're thinking about really, what is, the, what is the notion of joy? Why is the notion of joy introduced here? And also the concept of spending time with family, I'm going to call it a spiritual vacation, or I'm going to call it a family vacation. So we're in the end of August, and we read, we're at the beginning of August, but usually this is read in August, Parsha A. So this is the time people take vacations. So you should know that there's a, uh, um, a biblical mandate to take vacation with your family. So let's think about it. So when we think about giving charity, we think about tithing. We typically think about um, giving to the poor and giving to the person who does not have. And that is true. Within the Jewish agricultural cycle, you had to give 10% of your produce to the Levites. The Levite is the person who, the tribe who did not get a portion of the land of Israel. So they have no food, no way of supporting themselves when every, when it, in an agricultural society. So every year you have to give 10% of your produce to, to the Levites. In addition to that produce, you also have to give another 10% on year three and year three and year six of the cycle, and you have to give that to the poor, called Maser, I need the tithing of the poor. Okay, that's nothing, nothing I said here so far is shocking. But this real surprising tithing, and this is what we call the Jewish tithing because this is unique to Judaism, is that year one, two, four, and five, you have to take 10% of your produce and you have to give it to who? You have to eat it by yourself but you can't eat it in your house. You have to go on vacation. You have to pack your bags, take 10% of your produce and spend, and you has to be eaten in Jerusalem. Now you, with all due respect, you cannot eat 10% of your produce in Jerusalem. It's just too much food, right? Think about the 10%, if you say 10% of what you eat all year, of your income all year to spend in Jerusalem. Okay, so you have to obviously bring along people. You have to bring your family and your friends and your maidservants and the convert and the, and the, and the, and the stranger. And you have to come together with other people and you have to celebrate in Jerusalem. And that's a commandment every year. And it has to be done in Jerusalem and it has to be done with joy. And this is a very strange notion. It's a very strange notion because how is this that 
going and eating food in Jerusalem, it's not even holy food. Well, it is holy. It is holy, but it's not a part of, it's not, it's not a sacrifice, right? Anything you will eat with that, with, the, with, with that, that produce that you eat in Jerusalem becomes holy. You have to eat it in Jerusalem. Now, we understand that it's very difficult to pack it. You need a few 18 wheelers to uh, track your trailers to bring all your produce to Jerusalem. So the Torah gives you the solution. You could exchange the produce for money, take the money to Jerusalem, and all the money you spend becomes the, that produce becomes holy, and that, that money becomes holy. It's that holiness transfers to the produce you will buy in Israel, the food you will buy in Israel in Jerusalem with that money. And whatever you buy from the second tithing, from the second Maishani, the second tithing must be eaten in Jerusalem and it must be eaten with joy. So here we have a whole new notion of what does it mean to serve God. If you think about the pilgrimage, people are coming to, to, to serve God. What do you think about? So in our mind, the pilgrimage is a place you go to the temple, you go to serve God. I don't know why, if you ever went to Mecca, I don't know if you did, but if you go and you'll see everyone's bowing down. What's our idea of a pilgrimage? Our idea of pilgrimage is you're eating with your family and you're rejoicing. Family, friends, with the poor, with the Levi, with the convert, you're eating together with other people, you're eating good food and you're rejoicing and that's the pilgrimage. That's how you serve God. And you know what the verse says, a very strange verse. The verse says, you have to eat your seven, second tithings in Jerusalem. You know why? So you will learn to fear God. Not you have to go to the lecture so you can learn to fear God. Not that you have to go to the sermon on Yom Kippur so you will learn to fear God. No, you want to learn to fear God, you have to go and eat your second tithings in Jerusalem. Okay, I want to show you, I want to show you some of the verses here. Okay, let's read a little bit. We'll go to the fifth reading. We'll read, we'll read a little bit of the, of the, the idea of the, of the second tithing in Jerusalem. So here we go. Aser to Aser, you shall tithe all the seed crop that your field gives forth year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place he chooses to establish his name therein, which is Jerusalem. It wasn't named Jerusalem, but the, this phrase, the place where God will choose, comes and says, and, and, it, and, and it repeats itself many times in the parsha. So you're going to take 10% of your produce and you're going to bring it to the place that God chose to establish his name therein. The tithe is of your grain, your wine, and your oil, and the firstborn of your cattle and of your sheep, so that you may learn to fear God to fear the Lord your God all the days, okay? You shall eat, so this, this is the strangest, I, I'm telling you, I, I would be surprised if you can find any other religion that has a verse like verse 23. You shall eat before the Lord, you're gonna eat your, your, your grain, your produce, so that you may learn to fear the Lord. How does eating um, good food and meat and having a barbecue teach you to fear the Lord? I don't know, let's continue, 24. Um, and if the way, and if the way be too long for you, that you are unable to carry it. In other words, you live in uh, up north. You live on the Golan Heights, and you're growing um, uh, um, um, grapes, and you can't schlep all your ten percent of your grapes to Jerusalem. So what do you do? For the place which the Lord your God will choose to establish His name therein is too far from you. For the Lord your God will bless you. Verse twenty-five. Then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand, and you shall go to the place the Lord your God will choose. And you shall turn that money into whatever your soul desires. In other words, you should spend that money on anything you want, on cattle, sheep, new wine, or old wine, or whatever your soul desires. And you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. And as for the Levite who is in your cities, you shall not forsake him, for he has neither portion nor inheritance with you. In other words, don't just be, don't just celebrate with your own family. Also invite the people who are less fortunate. And that's again, a theme that repeats itself about the pilgrimage. So here we have a very strange mitzvah. You have to have, think about it. How long would it take you and your family to eat 10% of your produce in Jerusalem? It's really a catch. Remember, it's a catch. God wants you to spend a significant amount of time with your family in Jerusalem, doing nothing, not working, enjoying yourself in the presence of the holy city. And that is the experience of fear, fearing God, and that's the experience of joy. What are we saying here? What are we saying? We're saying that in Judaism, 
the way we feel connected to God is not only when we're involved in the spiritual. In other words, most religions will tell you there's the spiritual and there's the physical and they are at war and you have to escape the physical and you have to go to the spiritual. And especially, it's not always possible, but especially if you want to come before God, coming before God is the act of escaping this physical and, and, and turning your attention away from the distracting physical reality and focusing on the spiritual. That is most, what most religions, almost every religion will tell you. That's why I say Judaism is not a religion. It's not a way to escape the physical. Here you see Judaism's idea of being close to God, of fearing God and rejoicing with God is eating the meat, eating your produce in a wholesome environment. That is what, that's the commandments. That's the vacation you have to take because during the year you're busy. You have, to, you, you have to work in the field and you have to run errands and you have to, get, you, have to, you, have, you have to catch the train. You're busy. When do you have time to devote to spirituality? We don't always have a time. So we make time, we have Shabbat, but in the biblical times, you also had to spend, like I said, so in this par parish is also the pilgrimage, the three holidays. But in addition to the three holidays, you have to spend time to eat the second tithing, to eat 10% of your produce, which means you're going to spend time in Jerusalem. What happens in Jerusalem? Well, you go to the museum, you go to the lecture, you go to the yeshiva, but you're not escaping your food. You're bringing your food along with you. You're rejoicing with the bread, with the, with the meat, with the produce, with the wine, with the oil, with everything God blessed you. In other words, our idea of spirituality is connecting the spiritual to the physical, not escaping the physical. And that's a big idea of this week's parsha, and it repeats itself many times. That's why in this parsha we have joy, because what is joy? Joy is something, when is the person really joyous? You're joyous when the holiness expands to every area of your life. You know, a lot of people think, see religious people and say religious people are always serious. Why are they always serious? because they don't really want to be here. They really want to be in heaven. They really want to be studying Torah. And the fact that they have to nebach, they have to go and eat supper is a distraction from their spiritual pursuits. And there were a lot of spiritual seekers who their attitude is, well, you have to be serious because, because engaging in this world is really a one big distraction. But Judaism says, and I'll, I'll give my unbiased opinion, Hasidism highlights is that no, that's not the state of mind that a person is supposed to be in. A state of mind a person is supposed to be in is joy. And why joy? Joy because in every experience you can find God. Finding God is not just learning to fear God, learning to have awareness of God is not just in the spiritual, but also in the physical. If you can eat in a holy environment, then you will learn to fear God when you're eating your produce. And you're seeing how everything you work for for the entire year is really here to give you a wholesome connection to God. And that is the big new idea introduced in this parsha telling us that Judaism is about sanctifying the physical and how the religious obligation to eat your produce and eat your food and eat all the fruits, of, enjoy the fruits of your labor, but it, but it should be in Jerusalem, meaning in a holy environment. Of course, today we don't have the obligation to eat, to, 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 to eat the second tidings in Jerusalem, but the lesson and the attitude of the second tithing is very true in our life. And that is that where do we find God? Where do we find God? Not just in the spiritual experience, but also in the physical experience. And that's why, um, that's actually also one of the big ideas of Hasidism. And that is that if you read the writings of the Baal Shem Tov and his students, they keep making this point. You can find God in everything you do. It's based on the verse of King Solomon, but in every experience you have, even the most mundane, the most physical, could be an avenue to connect you to your source, to the source of all the good, to the source of all the blessing. So this is a story in, sh in short. Make sure to have time to spend with your family and with your loved ones, and you enjoy the good meat and the good food, and you do it in the presence of Jerusalem, which means you understand how enjoying God God's blessings to you will help you move you closer to the year ah, which is translated as fear, but it's really awe, but it's really awareness to the awareness of God. So that's the story in short, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to take up too much time because now is a good time to go on the vacation. Vacation doesn't mean you have to travel anywhere. You can be present, but it means you're not distracted. You're totally focused on celebration with your family and friends. So you can do it uh, on Zoom. You could do it in person. You can go do it by going up, by leaving your house. You can have a staycation, whatever you like to do. Um, make sure that you find time to be present with your loved ones and you're enjoying the produce. You're enjoying the fruits of your labor but you're doing so in a way that it actually increases the awareness of God. And that's the big mitzvah of the second tithing. So thank you for joining. 
and enjoy the day and enjoy the season. And thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Uh, and you, I think you answered my question already, but I just want to clarify. Thank you, you Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just want to. Thank wanna... you, Rabbi. Thank you, Steve. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah, I, ju I just want to clarify about this so beautiful concept that fearing God is expressed by going to Jerusalem and spending time with family and friends. So in that context, is fearing God emphasizes that relationship with family and friends are very important as an expression of fear of God. It, it, yeah, so fear is a scary word. We don't like fear, especially now. I mean, awe, awe, and respect. Or awareness, or awareness. Yeah, awareness. Yeah. Awareness, yes, that's what Judaism is telling you. Judaism is telling you there's no aspect of life that is not uh, connected to God. And the real way to fe real feel, really feel connected to, to, uh, to God is actually connecting to the meaningful, the meaning in your life. And what's the meaning in your life? The people closest to you. And when you connect to them and you transcend the self and you connect to others, that's the ultimate way to come close to God. And again, it mentions the Levi. And it also mentions the Levi when it comes to the holidays, the Levi and the poor. And Maimonides quotes this. We just finished learning it because we read three chapters of Maimonides a day. And we just finished reading the, the, the laws of the holidays. And Maimonides says, if you're just celebrating with your own immediate family exclusively, then it's not a holy joy. To make it a holy joy, you have to go beyond the self. And you have to invite the people less fortunate. So that's sort of the test of whether the joy is a selfish joy or it's a joy of transcendence. And if you can invite the lady, if you can invite the person less fortunate, you're connecting to someone beyond yourself, then that's the test that the food is actually bringing you closer to, to the awareness of God and not, and not vice versa. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Beautiful. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everybody. And uh, we'll see each other in good health. Just a programming note. I sent out an email. That Sunday, which is not, I should have said it earlier, we're not going to have a class on Sunday because we have, to, we have a bar mitzvah we have to officiate at. And tomorrow also, we're not going to do the Song of Songs, even though very difficult for me to postpone the Song of Songs because it's my favorite, my favorite uh, um, study course nowadays. But my sister had a baby boy, thank God, and I have to do tomorrow. Mazel tov. It's not upstate New York, so we have to travel. So we, we're going to be back for Shabbos, but away for Friday. So Song of Songs is gonna to have to wait and that's gonna increase the yearning because that's one of the themes of the song. And when you don't have what you want, it's not really a separation, <laughs> just highlighting the yearning and the longing. And then when we reunite with the Song of Songs, it's gonna be with even greater joy and passion. Well, muscle, also, muscle, 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 spending time with your family is a big mitzvah, an expression of fear of God. Very good, very good. Very There's good. the timing. <laughs> Yeah, muscle tough, can Rabbi. You, drive you, carefully. Can you hear us, Rabbi? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Because before you couldn't hear us. Yeah, in the beginning, I could, could be my 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 sound was off. It could be, but now I'm back. Now I'm listening. Now now I'm listening again. Can I ask one question, Rabbi? I know that it's going a little bit late, but I'm not going to be able to ask it tomorrow or on Sunday. Okay. Maybe it's too long. <laughs> but not able to fall asleep if you don't get the answer. I don't want you to have to stay up all night. <laughs> Well, it saves me the research time, <laughs> call it that. Um, there was mention of the blood of the sacrificial animal. And is there at some point in time when you're going to be discussing that at length? Um, I didn't have a plan. So what we'll, we'll put it on the calendar for next year. We'll discuss it at length. But since I don't want you to have to wait a whole year, <laughs> so I'll do 60 seconds. So what does the blood represent? But blood represents life. Right, the, the verse says we're not allowed to eat the blood. Why not? The blood is the is the soul. We don't eat the soul, we eat the body. Now there's many, many layers of interpretation of what that means. I'm gonna give you the, straight to the Hasidic interpretation. Within the physical experience, there is the body of the let's let's take a piece of meat. There's the body and the soul. So soul is blood, blood represents passion. The question is, where is my passion? Okay, I have physical pleasure, but what's my ultimate passion? So one way to look at it, I enjoy the physical world. I eat a good tuna sandwich or a good steak. I have a nice car, I have a nice house. 
and my blood is invested in the materialism. That we don't do. The blood, the passion, we pour on the altar. When you bring an offering to God, you bring an offering, you could eat the meat, but the blood you, you leave at the altar, representing that your soul, your passion, what you really want is a connection to God. And that's why when you go home and you're allowed to eat meat, so the meat, of course you can have meat. Of course you have to enjoy everything that, the, that God has and all the beautiful things that God and the pleasurable things, the physical pleasurable things that God gives us in this world. But they're here to serve your true passion. Your true passion, your blood, mm -hmm. the blood, the true passion is reserved for the service of God. So we're not gonna consume it in a mundane way. So the blood we don't eat, the blood is for the temple. The true passion is for God. So of course I, 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 I seek material pleasure. But why do I seek material pleasure? It's not a means for an end. I'm sorry, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the ultimate goal, it's a means for an end. I enjoy myself, I enjoy the physical pleasures so that I can be in a happy state of mind so then I can do what I really need to do which is serve God, right? If a person can't serve God, you can't, be a, you can't serve God or you can't study Torah if I'm in pain, if I'm not healthy, if I'm poor, if I'm hungry, if I have no food, if my home is not beautiful, right? The more pleasure, the more physical, the Talmud says, that a beautiful home will expand the mind, right? If you're sitting in a beautiful environment and you have a beautiful garden and you're studying Torah, oh, now you'll understand far, far more than when you stood, you're sitting in some shtetl in, this, in, the, in, in the synagogue that's about to collapse on its head, right? If you, your mind is not expand, ex, and does not expand the same way. So the point here is that of course, all the physical pleasures are um, permitted, but not the blood. The blood represents the ultimate passion, the ultimate passion you pour on the temple. Or you don't, don't touch it. You don't take. You don't take it from the physical. You don't consume it. You don't consume the blood from the physical from the from the physical um, animal because the passion from the physical that we don't take. We take its body, not its soul, because the soul is reserved to God. So I'm not sure if that fully makes sense because we need an hour to explain it, to elaborate upon it. But that is the story in short. If, if that I was that was a great explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And have a safe thank you. Have a safe trip. Drive carefully. Watch out for yes. the crazy drivers. Are you going to Liberty in Monticello? Oh, we're not going to Monticello. I'm going to uh, Tannersville. So it's a little bit. To where? Tannersville. Tannersville, New York. It's a little bit out of the way. It's not. It's not on the. It's not. It's not in uh, Sullivan County. Sounds familiar, but I'm not sure. Well, you just go a little farther up to 17, and then you not to 17 to 87, and then you turn off at some point. Just be safe. Have a wonderful Thank you very time. Much. and Mazel Tov. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye bye. Bye bye.